welcome everybody. This morning we have the wonderful Jonathan Castillo. Go ahead and wave again. Um, he is our collaborative pianist. For those of you who don't know him, um, he's been working with Big Trip Studios since we started here in Austin. I believe it was late 2016, early 2017. It's been a while, which is amazing, and we're so lucky and happy to have him. Um, he's been the official pianist uh, that accompanies everyone at recitals, and he also does private coachings. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and just sort of summarize his bio, um, which is really impressive. Um, he is everywhere. He is in a concert hall. He's in pubs. I did not know that. That's really fun. Um, and he's in recording studios working uh, and uh, collaborating with other musicians as the, as the collaborative pianist. Um, he's the music director for UBC Austin, where he's directing a choir and he plays the organ. Um, he's the principal bassoonist for the Mid-Texas Symphony and second bassoonist for the Shreveport Symphony. Um, you've He's been performing all over the greater Houston area, including theater under the stars and the Texas Repertory Theater. Um, style and genre, Jonathan does, Jonathan does it all. I just said Jonathan. <laughs> Jonathan does it all. He's uh, worked with classical uh, musicians, operatic singers, um, musical theater singers, and commercial singers. So he's, um, if you have a, a type of music you want to bring to him, he's ready uh, regardless of what the style is. Um, he also has a Bachelor of Music degree in bassoon performance from Baylor, as well as a Master of Music from the U from UT Austin. Is that about it, Jonathan? <laughs> Sounds right to me. It's good enough. Wow. So welcome. I'm so happy that uh, we're doing this master class this morning. So why don't we begin? Go ahead and tell me what is a collaborative pianist and what makes a collaborative pianist different from a pianist? Sure. So First of all, thank you for having me. I, I miss everybody so much. I miss being able to be in person with the Big Chirp Studio. So uh, I'm very, very happy to be able to interact with you virtually today. Um, a collaborative pianist is essentially a, a collaborative musician, someone that you get to really make music with. We've all sung to karaoke tracks, whether for a performance or just for fun in the car. And there's that live element missing where you have a musician who is making music not for you, but making music with you. Uh, they are sensitive to your needs. They'll be able to adjust to whatever it is you were doing in the moment, but also they're usually someone that you have spent a considerable amount of time with in a rehearsal. So you have this chemistry already to be able to interact with each other with even such a simple gesture as a shoulder motion or something. Um, they're someone who is usually a, a pretty qualified musician who will have their own approach to the music that you're singing or playing if you're an instrumentalist. They are somebody who will be able to offer more than just a backing track, but someone to offer musical guidance with you to help fine tune and make a really, really cohesive performance. Amazing. So as we can see, uh, when you're working with a pianist, a pianist doesn't necessarily have to have education behind uh, the, the person. They don't have to have a degree in collaborative piano or any other instrument. Instrument. Um, maybe they just play piano for fun and they, you know, you hope that they follow you as you sing. A collaborative pianist uh, usually has some sort of uh, musical degree and they, uh, their focus is to work with you. So um, I'm not sure how many of you have worked with a pianist before that uh, you get on stage and they just go, the tempo goes, you look at them and you, you see nothing and you're like, help. That's not a collaborative pianist. The collaborative pianist looks at you, works with you, is watching when you breathe to do the phrasing with you. So this is why it's so important to work with a collaborative pianist if you're creating music, because music is after all something beautiful. Um, and what are we making if we're not making it together, right? Great. So. Um, in the chat, everybody will, I don't, I don't know if you're able to see, I've added a PDF that Jonathan has so graciously uh, um, provided about summarizing what we're gonna talk about today. So if you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand or um, let me know because this really is a conversation. Um, yes, so go, go ahead, Jonathan, and start us off. What are some 10 things perhaps that we should know? And we'll stop after each one if anybody has a question. So the First thing that I always like whenever I'm working with, um, whether it's somebody who I've worked with before or someone who I'm meeting for the first time, is that they've already done a, a good amount of work on the music. So they come to me with a good idea of the piece. And with that comes 
hopefully a knowledge of where some issues are going to be. If you've listened to recordings or if you have sung with a backing track, you know, on YouTube, um, places that you know kind of give you trouble either with the solo line versus the, the accompaniment line or just places that you struggle to get through musically. Um, knowing any problem spot you may have gives uh, the collaborative pianist or myself uh, a lot to, to work with. Uh, and usually as a collaborative pianist, we have a lot of ideas on how we can get through those tricky sections, not only as an individual, but as a team. So that's great. So the first thing that we should all remember if, if we're making an appointment to work with our vocal coach, also known as a collaborative pianist, sometimes, many times they're one and the same, um, is to already come prepared, knowing where your problem spots are, so you can right away say, hey, I have a problem, you know, system two, measure three, let's check this out and fix it together. Right? With the, how does that save time in a coaching if a, pian if a singer already comes knowing the problem spots? So it saves a lot of time because oftentimes if someone is either still in the very early stages of learning the piece or if they just don't maybe know what they're coming to me for, uh, we spend time kind of singing through the piece and singing through the piece uh, before we can really tackle it's like, ah, this is a consistent area where we struggle to, to line up together or to have a, a concrete musical idea. There's consistency lacking. Um, but that? knowing where those spots are allows us more time to dig into those individual spots, which is going to create a more cohesive picture in, in the long term. Ah, oh, amazing. So what does that also tell you about a singer who comes ready with knowing what they want to work on? If you are working an audition, for example, and you have a few minutes before, what does that tell you about that kind of singer, kind of professional you will have? It's the kind of singer I like working with, first of all. Uh, and it tells me that they not only are dedicated to, to, to the music making, but they're dedicated to really utilizing this time for maximum benefits, uh, being able to, to extrapolate everything we can from each other. Uh, and that's going to be someone who's just very, very committed to the music making. Amazing. Does anybody have a story about showing up and working with a pianist ahead of time, a collaborative pianist, in which you say, hey, I know I'm going to have a problem ahead of time, and how did that work for you? Anyone? <laughs> I, I, for my experience is the opposite, where I came in like thinking that I was great, and Jonathan showed me all the places where I was screwing up. <laughs> Also important, you know, a collaborative <laughs> pianist no, you know, has, an, has uh, the, the education to look at the music and find things that oftentimes a singer won't find, which is why uh, he's so invaluable. Okay, wonderful. What's the next thing we should know about? This, they go hand in hand. Um, and uh, Brad, this is something that you've always been good at. It's, it's allow yourself to stop, even if you're mid phrase, to just stop and say, hey, I have a question on what's happening here and to, to not be bashful or not be afraid to ask pretty pointed and in-depth questions. It's those questions that are gonna to start to really get at the root of any, any inconsistencies that we're having or any problem areas to, again, create a more cohesive musical structure in the long term. And yeah. so even if you aren't showing up with, you know, a, a bunch of areas that you have, maybe you just have one or two, but in the midst of that, that, that time together, being able to stop and be like, hey, could you talk me through what's happening right here? Yeah, and there's a lot we can learn from being humble about what we are bringing to the table as well. Um, I, I've seen singers get all the way through a phrase or even a page or a song and you can see the struggle, the struggle point and then they keep going and it's like at that point we're not in it anymore. So let's stop, let's save time, let's figure out what we're working with, right? And will, will a singer ever offend you by stopping in the middle of a phrase and saying I want to work on that? Not at all. In fact, I really appreciate it because um, Oftentimes, I think it goes the other way where, um, you know, especially if it's the first or second time that we're working together, we, there's a tendency to not want to step on each other's toes too much until you get more comfortable. Um, but I think kind of putting that off to the side and knowing that there is that, that trust that is developing between, between the two. And I'll add to, to, the, to the statement that whenever you allow yourself to stop and ask a question, kind of in the moment, it also really shows that you are, you're really invested in every single moment of the music instead of just kind of skating by the phrase, if that makes sense. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. Skating by the phrase isn't making music. Making music is being in it every second 
uh, mind, body, soul, words, uh, connection, for sure. All right, what's the next thing? This is really big. <laughs> yeah. uh, if there is a specific translation that you're using, should you be singing an aria that is in a different language or even commercial music that's in a different language, uh, providing that translation as much ahead of time is extremely beneficial. Oftentimes, uh, between different publications, the, the translations are different enough that it can kind of change the subtext and even that sometimes the, the kind of emotional core of, of a piece. So providing that specific translation so that the collaborative pianist can also be fully invested in that same storyline uh, will be pretty invaluable. Uh, and that can happen in two ways. You can just provide a separate you know, paragraph of text or if you've written it into your own copy of music and it's clean and legible, you can scan that in and send it to the collaborative pianist and that is also very, very helpful. Yeah, so that's a really common thing for those of you who sing opera. There are two, I mean, there are many different uh, publishers that create operatic scores, but two that come to my mind immediately are Shermer versus Berenreiter. Shermer has a reputation of being incorrect, whereas it's easier to play the music, it's cleaner. Um, there's a reason people choose Shermer, but a lot of times the translation cannot be 100% on, whereas Berenreiter tends to be. Um, there are benefits to both, but really as the singer, you should come already with your translation because that way, if your collaborative pianist does not know what a certain word no, uh, means, you know what it means. And having that word appear on a certain phrase or high note gives that note more meaning as well. Right, Jonathan? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and that may, goes kind of into, if there's a recording that you've been listening to, if, if there's, whether it be on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, that also is tremendously valuable because the more often you listen to a specific recording, the more likely it is going to be to pretty dramatically influence the way that you sing any piece. Mm -hmm. um, and that will help your collaborative pianist be able to anticipate a little bit more how you might be stylizing uh, a phrase or the entire piece. Yeah, can you think of an aria, I know this is so offhand, an aria in which, well, since we're talking about opera, an aria in which you have heard uh, people uh, completely change the tempo? Yes. Uh, so uh, as I was preparing for this, I was thinking, I was like, what are some pieces that I have just played to death? And uh, anything from the Italian arias, but I was thinking more specifically, uh, Caro Mio Ben. Oh my. Uh, I've played, I don't know how many times. And what's, and, and on one hand, you know, you're like, oh, Caro Mio Ben again. But on the other hand, everybody sings it a little bit differently. And it can be really exciting uh, as a collaborative pianist to be able to find new nuances in, in a piece that even you've played over a dozen times. Yeah, definitely. And there's new meaning by changing the tempo, changing the focus, especially when you can. You know, what comes to my mind is that um, is a commercial song, Can't Help Falling in Love With You. You have the original, I, I believe it was in six, was it in six, eight or four, four? And then you have, and then one of the newer ones, uh, it's a pop version. Do you remember? It was like a gum commercial. It made everyone cry. It was gorgeous. It was really, really slow. She sang it in a totally different way, disconnected head voice the whole time, breathy and beautiful. And all of a sudden that song changed its meaning. It changed, I mean, well, the core meaning, Can't Help Falling in Love With You was the same, but, but, but from, a, from the perspective of the listener, it's a completely different song. So, um, yeah, so that creates some excitement, right? For you too, Jonathan. It, it, and I think that's the benefit of having a collaborative pianist versus just someone who shows up and just plays through a song for you, is that you get to really dig into that meaning together uh, to create a more powerful expression of, of any song. Absolutely, um, and that, uh, that brings me uh, another idea, uh, there were, three ideas that I thought of this morning that you really, really need if you are a collaborative pianist working with other people, and Jonathan, of course, has them all. The first is a love of making music with other people. Have you ever shown up and made music with someone and you're like, oh man, they're checked out. This is not gonna work. I remember this in choir settings. Not everybody is there 100% sometimes. And, but I mean, don't get me wrong. Oftentimes there are choirs in which everybody is cohesive and that's a real uh, music making bunch of people. But you really have to love making music with other with others. You have to have a love of telling stories because the words drive the meaning as a singer. As an instrumentalist, uh, you know, they always say to a singer, sing like an instrumentalist, you know, so you have long phrases that are connected. They tell instrumentalists, play like a singer, find the words behind it. Did, have you ever heard that, Jonathan? 
Of course, I mean, that's what I was thinking. It was like, that's what we say all the time. It's like, play like you're singing it. Yeah. We, we, as, an, as a bassoonist, you know, I, as, when I was an instructor and when I was in lessons, uh, the teachers would be like, put words to this line. Like, make a story out of this music. Put words to every single note. Um, yeah, and as, your, as our collaborative pianist, this way, <laughs> as our collaborative pianist, how does, how does uh, hearing the words behind it change how you phrase it? If you know a singer comes in and they say, you know what, the word here is love, but my subtext is obsession. How does that change how you play with them? It's it, I'll essentially follow the way that they are, are moving. And as, as singers, we are telling pretty direct stories some of the time. Sometimes it's a small part of a larger story, but oftentimes it's a whole story in, in itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, your body language can give so much into that. And how you move can dictate kind of the intensity of the music, whether I, I kind of give it a little bit more grounded sound or it's a little bit lighter and um, fleeting. Uh, it, can, it, can, it can dictate the, the approach to which not only to which you've seen the music, but also into which the, the, the pianist can, can support you in doing that. So that may, I don't have the PDF in front of me that may get us out of order, but I want to talk about movement as a singer when you're working with a collaborative pianist, right? Um, how many of you guys have worked with a collaborative pianist in, in, on stage and found that how you breathe dictates how they play? Anybody? Yeah. Not Susan, Lindsay, Jesse. Yeah. Oh, can you unmute and tell us about that? Or I'll unmute you. I mean, I'm thinking back to different times. There's been so many times with different pianists that sometimes you go in and, and they know nothing. And it's, it's like frustrating because it'll be an audition. And it, you feel like your whole audition was killed. Um, but then there's other times where they kind of help you bring the character out. So yeah. So that's a collaborative pianist. Can you tell us an example of when somebody you've gone in for an audition and regardless of how you're, I want to, I want to talk about how to move with the pianist as well. So, so. Well, I mean, you know, for example, uh, back when you and I were at New World, um, and there would, well, I'm so, I can't even remember her name. Was it Lilia? Lilia Zayarna. She was amazing. And when she wasn't there, that's when you can tell, oh my gosh, the whole song is different. I can't do it. Like it was, she just kind of made the singer and we were all so new and learning so much. We didn't realize how important that was. So I always think about that, like, wow, you can bring this person anything. And they made the singer and the song so much more than it was. And when she wasn't there, it was like, ah, oh, well, like, I don't know how to sing the song anymore. So. <laughs> In, in that sense, I mean, I guess, I don't know. It was, I, I haven't sung with a collaborative pianist in so long that I, I don't, I don't know, but I would be so excited to sing with Jonathan. <laughs> like, it really makes or break the, breaks the singer. I mean, as a singer, yes, yeah, you have to be able to hold your own. You know your tempo, you know where you're breathing, you know the meaning. And unfortunately, if you have a pianist that's not a collaborative pianist, they, it goes off the rail. I've had that happen in an audition too. Um, you just, Pick your tempo and you go. And if they don't follow you, and that's unfortunate, especially in an audition situation. But let's say you have time to work with Jonathan or someone like Jonathan, and um, you haven't spoken about where your pauses are. You haven't spoken about uh, where the phrasing changes. How does, uh, can anybody tell me how you would move your body to let someone know? Or let it nod your head. Okay, nod your head. Anybody else? I mean, they would go with the breathing too. They could see oh, you prepare yeah. the breath and then you could do a little nod. Okay. They, yeah. they see, I mean, usually when you're preparing for a song, you kind of like get ready, you stand there, you get it all in your head and then you, your body, I don't know, it just, there's, it, it's the breath mostly, but. Okay, yeah. So nodding your head when you're going to a phrase, maybe a little nod to let them know and we're moving on to the next phrase. Is that helpful, Jonathan? Yes, I think you hit the nail on the head there, actually, is, is the breath will tell me, or any collaborative pianist, if they're sensitive, so much. Because how you breathe not only dictates style, but it also dictate, dictates the speed into which you're about to start moving. Um, you know, a nice, you probably can't even hear me breathe on this microphone, but, you know, a gentle inhale, even with a little bit of a 
you know, you don't want to lift up your shoulders, but kind of that move with the breath mm -hmm. can tell me so much about what's about to happen. Um, more often than not, that's what I'm looking for is a movement with your breath to tell me or signal exactly what's about to come. Yeah. And can that work in different settings, uh, a coaching on stage, let's say in a recording studio, how a singer breathes, does that help you know how to follow and how to create music together? It, it's, it's pretty universal. Um, now a recording studio can be a little bit different. Uh, my recording studio experience is with more indie style music. Uh, and so there has been a click track to which I'm playing to. Yeah. So it, it takes a little bit of that, that musicality away but uh, it can still dictate the style to which I should play, even though it'll be pretty strictly in time with a little bit of nuance. Um, the breath will dictate kind of the, the style, the intensity or the, the lack thereof. The, the Absolutely. And in a lot of musical theater, you hear about click track as well. It's really important, especially if you have a, uh, a high stakes production to make sure everybody is on. And that's common, but you can still find movement uh, within it. So yeah, so Jonathan, can you give me an example of a singer that did not, uh, let's say the singer did not give you anything, did not move, did not nod. How do you know how to, how to find that singer and how to work with him or her? So I have two examples. Uh, one example is in a coaching, one example is in a performance. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a rehearsal or in a coaching, uh, oftentimes, uh, back when I was in school, a singer would you know, walk into the practice room and uh, we would, you know, chat for a second and then start. And because they had been doing everything a very specific way in their own practice room without any person around them, they just start singing. And as a collaborative pianist, you're frantically trying to just figure out what they're doing. And they're almost in their own little world, not giving any indication or acknowledgement to, to the other musician that is around them. Um, and that can be, sometimes it can be very frustrating if, it, if you address it and it never changes. Um, oftentimes a little bit of like, hey, if you, can you move a little bit uh, to show me how we're going, how we're moving through this phrase, or how, how you want to swell with these, these, these words that you're singing about. And um, oftentimes that can change it. A performance is a different scenario, because there will be times where you will be in rehearsals and everything will just be going really, really well. They're breathing, you know, they're looking at you, whether it be through the periphery or, you know, a direct eye contact at you. Um, it can be really great in the rehearsal setting and you feel like it's a really cohesive and um, collaborative experience. But then we get onto stage and as we are all familiar with, when those lights shine on us and you're in front of an audience, sometimes we forget a lot of what we've been working on. I've had that experience. I'm sure Sonia has had that experience. I'm sure everybody in this room has had that experience. Sure. Um, and in, in that case, it's, it's really falling back on as the, as the pianist, uh, knowing that even though it is a collaborative performance, my job is to support the, the soloist, uh, is to fall back on what I know we've done and, and try to encourage that more relaxed performance instead of that stressed out performance. Uh, and sure. sometimes for maybe the first you know, minute or 90 seconds, it, it's, it's a pretty tense situation. There's not a lot of movement. Uh, it's, it's not full deer in the headlights, but it is um, not as communicative of a, of a performance. And then oftentimes if I'm able to encourage them by, by myself staying relaxed, I can oftentimes get the singer into a more present performance. That's me. that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Any, anybody have questions about how to move for a singer? So using our breath, does that mean that we breathe higher and we use clavicular breathing if we're singing opera? No way. We can still breathe lower, but move our body independently. It doesn't have to be breathing and mess up our breathing to show the collaborative pianist how we're, how we're um, phrasing, but, but moving our body in a way that we're elastic, but still keeping supportive breathing as a singer. Yeah, cool. What's next? Be daring. I, uh, we are, <laughs> I have a lot of opinions on this, but ultimately what I will say is it is a good and a wonderful thing to take bold risks. I, I think it can be invaluable to, to your growth as a musician and, uh, and can contribute wildly to your musicianship. Um, whether you have, you know, wild hair and you're like, you know what? 
I'm going to try this. I've never tried this before and I'm going to, I'm going to do it as long as it's with healthy, good technique, go for it. Uh, and be likewise, be, be receptive. If the collaborative PMS is like, Hey, what if we do this instead of this? Like, what do you, what do you say to try X, Y, and Z instead of what we just did and be, be receptive to that idea, but and also be willing to, embody it and, and really go for it. Um, there, are, there are times where you might have a great idea, but you hold back from really committing to, to performing it. And suddenly that good idea seems like a bad idea. But if you always commit and can be bold and daring, like you are just trying to, to sell it, uh, you can find that, that you can make music 10 times bigger and 10 times more expressive than, than if you're holding back or afraid to try something that seems a little outlandish. Yeah, and it's a very vulnerable thing to, mm -hmm. to commit 100% to your idea, what, no matter what kind of music you're singing. It's really vulnerable, it's really naked, but it, that's what being a musician is about. You know, being daring and not being afraid to, uh, to be 100% in it. 100%. So what does that tell you about a singer when they come and they're, I mean, obviously, you are so kind and so, uh, such a wonderful, wonderful collaborative pianist, especially for new singers. You see the scared ones all the time. You know, somebody just comes and they're like, oh my gosh, I, I don't know, I can't even sing through this, let alone make decisions. It can be terrifying, but, but working with a collaborative pianist, this is why it's also important. If you know you're going to be working with someone for a performance, book a coaching ahead of time. You know, it's all about making that relationship, especially if you're a little afraid. Um, and you know, it's common to be afraid. If, uh, fear is is a common thing. But yeah, working with them ahead of time and and not being afraid to to uh, give your opinion about what you want to express. Absolutely, yeah. and and to be receptive and vulnerable to to new ideas to change it yes 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 i mean I've, I've definitely seen singers who say no i think it needs to be like this but and they can and they but that's the thing if you know it wants to be, if you want your music to sound a certain way to have a certain feeling be receptive to new ideas but also have the understanding and research behind it that you're willing to back up your idea yeah yeah absolutely is it's, it's all it's okay to be like no and here's why. Exactly. Uh, as long as you can reason why it should be a certain way more than, well, that's how Renee Fleming does it. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a good musical reason for, for singing a very specific way, that's great. And that, that tells me a lot. That tells me you've, you've done your homework. You have really invested time and energy into the song and that will help develop trust on my end as well as allow, allow us to make more, more cohesive music together. Yeah, and I think this is something else that you talk about near the end of your PDF, um, creating your phrasing and having ideas, uh, especially when it comes to commercial music and musical theater. If, if you're belting and all of a sudden you pull off to just head voice, what does that tell the, the collaborative pianist? Whoa, something's different. You know, something else is happening here. So regardless of what genre you're doing, make this make a decision ahead of time. Even things that you don't think you need to make a decision about. If you're singing commercial music, maybe go through the music and say, belt, mix, head, belt, 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 head voice. You know, and that way when you go through it and you sing it with the, the collaborative pianist, it's very clear where you're going. Operatically, of course, we're gonna sing full voice supported sound the entire time, but you can still create uh, different feelings with things like sotto voce. So supported, almost a whisper, you know. Um, good, please tell, me, tell us more. Anybody have questions so far about what this means? Anybody? Oh, we're all tired. Tell me next. <laughs> um, <laughs> provide music, this is, this is just kind of like clerical. Provide music as much in advance as you can. And going back to translations, provide the exact version of the music that you are using. And the third part about that is just double check that your scans don't have the bottom line of each page cut oh, off. Yeah. I can't tell you the amount of times I've gotten a piece of music and I've started practicing it and being like, the left hand is missing <laughs> on every page. Uh, so just double check that it's a clean copy and it is the same version of the song that you're using. Definitely, because sometimes different publishers have different, uh, uh, completely different notes written in, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes completely different notes. It's different, it's different music. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, 
this is a big one that I, I talk about a few times in the PDF. Be able to sing your music in time and with the correct rhythms. Oh. <laughs> it is, uh, this is something I talk more about with singers than I do with instrumentalists. Instrumentalists have a really hard time breaking away from the exact printed music. Singers love to do it. And uh, I think that's a beautiful thing. And oftentimes it can heighten the musical performance. But I think that we need to be able to, to know what the composer printed, whether it be opera, musical theater, or commercial music. It's good to know what is exactly on the page. And then using the, the, the musical phrase, and then of course using the words to, to reason why you would change it. Uh, it's, it's more than, well, that's how Patti LuPone does it, you know? And uh, being able to have your own musical reasons for why you should change what the composer printed. It's really common in musical theater to go off the walls with it. Yep. In, in opera, what we do more than change the rhythm, rhythm is stretch a beat for a very long time to really give these grand musical gestures. And that's beautiful and excellent but being able to know why this specific moment needs to happen. And what does it sound like if I, if I move through it with more motion? Um, and then from there, you can usually find where the real music lies. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you think of, you know, with opera, operatic rep, certain, certain composers lend a hand and want you to stretch and shrink phrases. Other composers do not. So knowing what you're singing, you know, maybe maybe you're not going to sing uh, something Mozart like you would sing Strauss, maybe not. Uh, but also, you know, thinking about, you know, on a, on a completely different note, musical theater, people love to make it their own. And if you don't make it your own, it's not interesting, you know? Like I, I think of Somewhere Over the Rainbow that I believe Ben Platt just sang, completely different song. I mean, still beautiful, but, but his own ideas brought into it. And then I'm also uh, reminded of that song. I don't know if you guys remember on, on the radio a while back, it was called In the Middle. Oh, baby, why don't you just meet me in the middle? Anyway, so that went around to a whole bunch of different studios and a whole bunch of different singers sang it until they finally found the one they liked. And why was that different? Because she sang it a little bit differently and that's what they wanted to market. So having your own ideas, knowing the who wrote it, knowing uh, the style and the genre and how it should be sang, and then making your own idea. Absolutely. We never want to just mimic what we've heard. We want to be our own musicians and be able to make our own musical choices. And that's, that's really where the fun in making music is. It's more than just singing, but it's becoming a fully formed musician that can, that can make any song, no matter, even if it's Caro Mio Ben, your own version of Caro Mio Ben. Or yeah. I mean, how exhilarating is it when you get someone who sings you know, you get a million Les Mis on my own and, you know, nine out of 10 are just standing there. And then the 10th one you hear all of a sudden, uh, there's a little bit of a different movement. They're breathing with you. They're creating music together. How does that make you feel as a collaborative pianist? And how does the audience feel? It, no, it, it, it draws everybody in. It'll draw me in. Uh, it, it also makes my job more fun. Uh, part of what I really love is, is responding to little nuances that a singer is providing. Um, and it's, it's that combination of a singer who's really, really selling the story and the musicians or musician uh, behind them fully supporting that story to give them that groundwork on which to, to, to tell their story. And it's that that can fully captivate an audience. It's the complete picture on stage that creates a performance. Yeah, everything you do, regardless of genre, has to be bigger than life. Why are we even singing otherwise, right? Cool. Give me, we have time for maybe one more. Perfect. Well, we're at the last one. So that oh, works. my gosh. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very simple and very short. Uh, if the pianist is agreeable to it, and I think everyone that I've worked with in, who is in this chat, we, we, this is standard practice, but do ask your collaborative pianist if it's okay if you record the session. Um, <sighs> being able to go back oftentimes when you're in a session and I, I've been there before is you're like you leave you, you leave the studio or you leave the person's house and you're like what just happened <laughs> so being able to go back and be like listen to it and listen to very specific things maybe over a few times be like ah now it settles in there are times where in the moment things might not click but when you go back and kind of have a third party perspective you'll be able to to see it from a new light and a new perspective and 
it'll hopefully settle in um, for the next time that you get to work with your collaborative pianist. Absolutely. Yeah. Record your sessions uh, because in the moment we don't always remember what's happening and it's so important. Um, thank you for everyone for coming today. We are out of time. Jonathan, you are a host of information. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, post your information if anyone wants to contact you and work with you. Yeah, cool. Um, so Jonathan, thank you for being here. Thank you everyone else for coming this morning. This has been so um, wonderful to learn about working with a collaborative pianist. Thank you all. Yay, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.